Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Way T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers with another edition of the Awesome Health Podcast. And today we are going to talk all things mitochondria, epigenetics, mold, Lyme disease, autoimmune, and neuroimmune disorders with none other than Dr. Tim Jackson. Uh, and he, Dr. Tim, who's joined us today has received his undergraduate degree in health science and chemistry from Wake Forest University in 2003. He completed his doctorate in physical therapy from the Medical University of SC, which I believe is right over here in Southern, is, is that Southern California or South Carolina? South Carolina. South Carolina, right. Yeah. Realizing that manual therapy and orthopedic care helped only some of his patients, he began studying functional and environmental medicine, as well as digestive health in an effort to help other achieve wellness. Dr. Tim is educated in nutritional biochemistry, digestive health and its system, uh, systemic effects, functional endocrinology, epigenetics, mold and Lyme disease and autoimmune and neuroimmune disorders. He completed the spine portion of the active release technique methodology, a system that addresses musculoskeletal trigger points and helps to expedite the healing process. Dr. Jackson trained with Dr. Kendall Stewart, MD, to learn the far-reaching implications of methylation deficits and their role in neuroimmune syndromes. Dr. Jackson's clinical expertise spans everything from brain rehabilitation, functional endocrinology, Lyme disease, and stealth pathogens, integrative gastroenterology, mold toxicity, epigenetics, and mitochondrial dysfunction. That is a super big amount of things. And I would say many of these are what I would quote unquote call the diseases of modern civilization, which have evolved particularly in the last hundred years and accelerating since World War II. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, whether we're talking about mitochondrial dysfunction or mold toxicity, or even the expression of certain epigenetic polymorphisms, you know, that's largely a result of environmental toxicity um, as well as, so when we talk about things such as mold, you know, you can be in the Amazon and you're exposed to tens uh, to one, uh, several hundred, uh, species of mold, but here we've created very energy efficient homes, but that energy efficiency comes at a cost and the cost is a uh, decreased circulation of indoor and outdoor air. And so you get an isolation of the subset of types of mold, and that's when mold starts to behave differently indoors than it does outdoors. Wow, that's such a great thing. Um, I grew up in a, a very old house when I was a kid that had uh, virtually, it had newspapers for insulation, and in the winter time, the wind would blow through the house and I would wake up some mornings with frost on my sheets and the scum of ice on the toilet and the walk to the toilet was definitely freezing on the feet. But, and, and I ended up training in a barn. Uh, sometimes it'd be 30, 40 to below. And when I was having my genetics and epigenetical um, responses, my epigenetic expert was saying, she felt that my early exposure to some of these extreme conditions was actually beneficial for my health. And while I was sick quite often when I was younger um, and I used to get strep throat and throat sore things, I haven't been sick in the last 17 years. And partly because of what I, what I do and the diet and, and how I eat for my genetics and epigenetics. Can you explain to our listeners, and many of them know, when you talk about epigenetic polymorphisms, it sounds like, you know, something really far out. Can you kind of bring that down to what that is and then how that relates to some of these things that you're dealing with in, in the modern era? Absolutely. So we talk about gene mutations. Most people are familiar with that term. So a polymorphism is simply sort of like a minor, minor version of a mutation. So our genetics, our DNA is made up of four letters, uh, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. So A, T, C, and G. 
A is supposed to bind to T and C is supposed to bind to G. So you got this sort of uh, molecular alphabet going on. If the body puts down the wrong letter in the wrong position, that is what's called a single nucleotide because each of those bases, each of those letters is a nucleotide, a single nucleotide polymorphism. And so some of the most common uh, polymorphisms that people have likely heard of, one is MTHFR, which has to do with homocysteine. Uh, it has to do with uh, neuroimmune syndromes, the production of glutathione, CoQ10, carnitine. And so you can have one copy of the polymorphism and that's referred to as heterozygous. You can have two copies of the polymorphism and that's referred to as homozygous. Um, some, to continue on that train of thought, some of the other commonly known polymorphisms are things such as COMT, catechol methyl transferase, and it plays a role in breaking down our stress-related neurotransmitters. Um, it also plays a role in metabolizing estrogen. Uh, some others are MAOA, known as the warrior gene. And there are some that have to do with breaking down histamine, such as DAO, or diamine oxidase. But what I tell people is that you can have uh, two people, one who's homozygous for every polymorphism that we know is clinically relevant, but they're living a healthy lifestyle. Like you mentioned, you know, the way you're eating, the way you're working out, the way you're thinking, uh, and they're going to be healthier than someone who has no copies of the polymorphism, but they're leading a very unhealthy life. Their sleep architecture is poor. Their diet is very poor. You know, they're eating fast food five times a week. And so, uh, you know, there's millions of polymorphisms. And if we just sat and went through uh, each one, uh, that would be very tedious. So I like to group them together based on pathways that they influence. And uh, that makes it a little more digestible for clients and patients. But, um, you know, toxin exposure, for example, uh, such as lead, aluminum, uh, toxins from candida albicans will interfere with the MTHFR or methylation cycle. Yeah. And let's go to that next, I think, because, you know, um, one of the things, and I've had my genetics read and my epigenetics, and I have some of those, you know, deviants or vari variants yet their actual impact on my overall health is negligible because of following virtually all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. And what was really interesting is I had kept a biofeedback. I've been big into biofeedback for my whole life, just writing journals and making note and paying attention to how my body feels, what kind of training I do well with, what kind of environment I do well, with, like all these kind of things that I've been watching over the years. And then when I did my genetics and epigenetics, it was, con it was literally concordant with feedback loops that I noted. Well, if I eat that, that goes around. I can eat some foods that you, you know, many well-renowned doctors say, well, this will cause this problem, this thing, but for my genetics, it doesn't bother me. And I said, well, yeah, right. well, that's great. Can you explain this whole thing of methylation? Because I think genetics is kind of the gun and, and epigenetics is like pulling the trigger and, mm -hmm. and, and lifestyle would be kind of like the bullets, <laughs> you know, you know, how many bullets do you want to load in the gun by your life? Every bad lifestyle choice related to your, to the, to your uh, genetics is kind of like putting another sh bullet in the gun and you're spinning the, the Russian roulette. Can you talk about what methylation is and what's its role in, in regards to genetics and epigenetics? Yeah, so methylation is actually the summation of around 200 different biochemical reactions. So it's not just one single reaction. And it simply means adding a methyl group. So what's a methyl group? It's a carbon with three hydrogen atoms. And so what are some things that get methylated in our bodies? Neurotransmitters get methylated. Hormones and hormonal metabolites get methylated. 
proteins get methylated. And so some of the functions that uh, methylation is responsible for in the body, one is T cell production. So T cells are certain types of immune cells and specifically CD4, CD8, which is the T helper cells to T suppressor cell ratio. And so that's one indirect marker for how well someone's methylating. It also impacts your production to, of glutathione. And we know glutathione is the most potent antioxidant in the body. And so every time we're exposed to a toxin, you know, if we want to excrete that toxin and metabolize it, we're going to use up some glutathione. And so I hear people all the time say, oh, well, you know, your body has natural detoxification pathways. You shouldn't need to detoxify anything. But there's a statute of limitations on everything. You know, I can fill up the gas tank in my car, but I can't drive from South Carolina to California without refueling, you know. And so um, those pathways get overwhelmed pretty quickly. And the average uh, baby born today, the average umbilical cord has between 250 and 300 known carcinogens. And that's just carcinogens. And so you can also have pathogen transmission from mother to baby. Uh, you can have high cortisol levels in the mother, uh, turn on a sort of fight or flight response in the baby. So, you know, those would be colicky or cranky babies. And uh, all of these things um, are influenced by methylation. But methylation is also responsible for the production of myelin. And myelin is the fatty coating around our nerves. And so, you know, it takes a long time for nerves to heal. And if you're not methylating well, it's going to take even longer. And so, uh, you know, folic acid, you know, is synthetic and it's what's added to grains and foods of that nature. But if women supplement with that while they're pregnant, that actually increases the chance for miscarriage. But if you su supplement with methylfolate or L5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is usually written as L-5-MTHF, that actually increases the chances uh, and likelihood of a viable pregnancy. You know, this is um, great information because I think uh, I'll use a, an example in the real world, and that is a guy like uh, Tony Robbins, who takes very good care of his health and has, has a, but has a very intensive lifestyle as well. And then recently he came out with, he had mercury toxicity from eating so much food. And he actually had the highest recorded mercury levels they've ever seen and was bleeding, uh, even taking blood transfusions before events. So Tony's a pretty high demand guy. And he spends a lot of time on detoxification technologies. But what a lot of people don't recognize is even if you're doing all the right things, there's a gradual buildup of being in the modern world of a variety of toxins. And there kind of becomes a point which becomes the tipping point where mm -hmm. you are exhausting these methylation pathways and your ability to detox. And then that's when you start getting the cascade of problems and they can't all of a sudden you can't eat these foods anymore. All of a sudden you start getting allergic reactions. All of a sudden your hormones go out of whack. And what mm -hmm. looks like these kind of mystery illnesses are generally the combination of the inability to detox whatever toxins you're going to relative to age, relative to lifestyle. But I wanna have a message of hope here. Obviously you're an expert in addressing how you bring someone back when, you know, essentially the apple cart has been tipped over and they're into a degenerative condition. How did you come to these conclusions? Because I think I love the science, but I, like, how did you get from that? Like, how did you get to this place where you started working on all these very complex and difficult issues? So uh, I always, I went to undergrad and I did well academically, but one of the residents, when I was doing a preceptorship at the medical school, he said, you could definitely uh, do medical school academically, but I know you're very much into nutrition and exercise and you're not going to get hardly any of that in medical school. He said, just get a ticket to play the game. 
And so while I was getting my doctorate in physical rehabilitation and orthopedic therapy, I was studying functional medicine sort of all along. And I'd had a very intensive, my senior year of undergrad, a very intensive oral surgery um, where they broke my upper and lower jaw um, to take bone from the lower jaw and add to the maxilla. And they added a lot of titanium to my body. And, you know, back then, at least in South Carolina, uh, functional medicine was not well known. I mean, there was really no one doing it. And the person that I eventually found, he didn't even call it functional medicine. You know, he just called it medicine. And so um, I started, you know, realizing I was the guy in undergrad where, you know, we studied the electron transport chain and cell and molecular biology oh, well, now we're in uh, biochemistry and we're studying the same electron transport chain. Like, you know, why don't we tie all this stuff together? And I think if they taught it that way, not only would students be more interested, but they'd also uh, be able to better comprehend and understand the significance of this. And so I was always one who tried to connect dots that seemingly were not connected. And uh, I didn't set out to get good at um, complex problems. It just sort of came as a natural byproduct. And uh, when I trained with Dr. Kendall Stewart in Austin, Texas, uh, he focuses a lot on epigenetics and stealth pathogens. And I had already been studying stealth pathogens a great deal. And so I just kept adding to that knowledge over and over. And I think where a lot of people go wrong is it's an if or if this or that approach, you know, so it's either heavy metals or it's mold or it's gut health. Well, they're all important. And for your particular set of issues, maybe gut health is 60% of the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, for someone else, mold might be 70% of their problem. Right. And so you have to examine all the variables. You know, that you made up a point. I was um, actually two doctors um, I recently come to check in with, which is very interesting. One of them is um, Dr. Horst Filzer, who is a, a vascular surgeon that was part of put the first stent in the body. And uh, another one was uh, a, a, you know, a well-respected doctor in Canada, who Dr. Hodkinson, who was sharing some information about some aspects of what's happened in today's hyper-specialized medical community. And that 40 years ago, Filzer was saying, or 50 years ago, as a surgeon, you were a general surgeon, and then you were also, and he branched into the heart surgery component. He says, but I couldn't wait to take the call at two o'clock in the morning. It was the gunshot wound. It was the guy with the stab wound. It was the car accident. So I'd go in, open them up, put them back together. Even though my main speciality was heart, I wanted to take those cases where I could save people's lives. And the and and that's from a acute care. And then Hodgkinson was talking about, you know, when he was in school, he's in his 70s or 80s as well. And he was like, as a general practitioner, you learned a, a wide variety of information. And if your patient started feeding you information that you, you weren't looking to plug it into a, a specialized data set, which were down one lane, you in, he said, doctors after 10, 15, 20 years would be able to walk into a situation and, and kind of work out these variables very quickly. And mm -hmm. both of them suggested that part of the hyper specialization has made our med our best medical minds to be hyper rigid and quote unquote, trust the data in the information. But that data set is in such a narrow band. They don't want to do the surgery that's not regular to the thing. They don't want to treat the conditions that's not within their pharmaceutical operations like th that they've been instructed with. And then you have these patients going in and they're not getting better and they're struggling for years and they're on 15 different medications and they're having side effects for the medications or they're getting into surgeries or a combination of the two and they're right. going to specialist to specialist to specialist but there's no communication between the specialists and any communication either i don't do this or total skepticism which i would suspect that that's probably 80 or 90 percent of the people that come to you are people that have that 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 problem they've been all over the place and can't mm -hmm. figure it out would that be accurate 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, some of the worst uh, cases that I hear about are from the most well-respected institutions. You know, the um, CDC, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, places like that. And uh, I had a patient a few months ago and uh, her husband was on the call um, for her appointment. And he said, well, my uncle's a doctor at Harvard. He said, mold's not important. And I said, well, you know, just because he said it doesn't make it true. And I think what happens is, you know, they want to be sort of the gatekeepers of everything. Mm -hmm. And so they hate direct consumer lab testing. They hate anyone taking control of their health. But the truth of the matter is there's going to always be enough sick people for every doctor to care for. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need to go around, you know, being hyper controlling of someone's environment, their lifestyle, their nutrition. And uh, you're exactly right. So the same thing that might help a very, very, very rare genetic heart condition uh, is the same thing that will harm, uh, you know, 90% of heart patients because they don't realize that the heart is very dense with mitochondria. And so one of the first signs um, after brain fog and memory loss uh, is cardiovascular dysfunction when you have mitochondrial issues. And so, uh, you know, the heart is also very much influenced by growth hormone and testosterone. And so, you know, the data shows if they would read it, that it's anything less than 550 nanograms per deciliter of testosterone puts us guys at risk of all cause mortality. And so, you know, but when you turn on the TV, all you hear is, oh, testosterone causes heart attacks. Well, they got that from a study where they took people who, guys who had around a 250 nanogram per deciliter level of testosterone, and they boosted them up just to around 350. And then several of them had heart attacks but it was because they didn't have enough testosterone, right. not too much. And, and you talked about something earlier and that was about methylation, particularly around hormonal components. And what we see in society today is a hyperestrogenization and a depression of testosterone levels dramatically. When we have these conditions of the male menopause, the increase in body fat storage, the uh, neurotransmitter deficiency that leads to a kind of a lack of vigor and drive in life. And as you said, not getting the testosterone to a sufficient level is very much similar to the psychiatric research, which they're showing people who were in super states of depression and they were adding psychiatric medications. And then some of the people start to kill themselves. Well, they didn't get the, the person was already dysfunction and they didn't get the dosage right. And they oftentimes associate the, the, the pathway up. It's just the person got enough juice to actually finish themselves off where they didn't have the juice before because they didn't quite, it was an extreme case. You're saying it's similar in this here, but beyond that, let's get into this relationship between stealth pathogens, mitochondria, and, and the kind of illnesses that you're seeing today in the modern world. Yeah, so stealth pathogens, you know, what I mean by that, the most commonly known or well-known stealth pathogen is Epstein-Barr virus. And they're called stealth because they have the ability to change the proteins on the coating of their surface so as to disguise themselves to our immune cells. And so typically, you know, it's thought of that, you know, you get Epstein-Barr or mono, and then you clear it from the body, but you never clear a virus from the body. You decrease the viral load and methylation happens to be one of the primary pathways that suppresses viral DNA replication. So it, viruses are very smart. They take their DNA, they incorporate it into ours. So every time our cells divide, they get a free ride, literally. And so if we slap enough methyl groups on there, the viral DNA expression is suppressed. But if we don't do that, then the pathogens can become reactivated. 
So uh, glutathione, it, you know, this is along the same lines of that. Glutathione is a natural antiviral. And so not only does it help with detoxification, but it helps to activate some immune cells such as the natural killer cells. Uh, other stealth pathogens would be things such as human herpes virus six. That's a virus that's been uh, shown to be correlated with chronic fatigue syndrome and chronic fatigue immune deficiency syndrome. You have mycoplasma, there's several types. It's a cell wall deficient bacteria. And the way most of our antibiotics work is they blow up the cell wall of the bacteria. So you really have a limited number of ways to deal with uh, some of these pathogens. And uh, they're, we call them stealth, you know, again, because they evade the immune system, but they create symptoms. For example, they can activate a type of cell in the brain called the microglial cells. And those are the white blood cells in the central nervous system. And they're supposed to be turned on and then turned right back off. But these pathogens can turn them on and keep them turned on. And so that can lead to depression, anxiety, insomnia, memory issues, focus issues. And so, you know, along the lines of our earlier example, I could go see a psychiatrist and, you know, he'd prescribe me Prozac or Zoloft or something of that nature, and maybe a benzodiazepine for the anxiety, but the cause may be something, you know, totally downstream. And that's the problem when you, you view things in isolation. Um, you know, it's really a disservice to the patient. And in the worst case scenario, you know, it can lead to death. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, I mean, the other pathogens, Lyme, the Lyme bacteria, Bartonella, Babesia, Candida, you know, and I've never seen in uh, my 12 years of practice, um, the presence of just one pathogen as a standalone. So normally, now a lot of times people might just test for one pathogen and it shows up positive and they say, oh, well, this person just had this. And I'll say, well, did you test for the other pathogens? Well, no. So how do you know they didn't have it? And so, uh, you know, that's sort of the quandary we find ourselves in. You know, that's, um, I think this part of the modern society where we're, um essentially overwhelmed with massive amounts of information and the structure and formation of the brain is that we try to take this low re resolution single cause theory oh because if you look at our advertising just press the button and it's done or just three easy steps you know and so we have an oversimplification of our society mm -hmm. plus a, a, an expectation of response that you know, I call it the, the, the Amazon expectation. When, when I was a kid, uh, and, I, and I, I, don't, I don't like to use those stories too, too much, but I think it's relevant. When I was a kid, if I wanted to have Christmas presents at Christmas time, I had to check the boxes in September when the when Christmas catalog came out in September. And then we would order, my mom would order the products based on what I had checked in the box or whatever. And that's what, you know, I would get for Christmas, but I had to wait three, four months in order for the truck to get there and to figure out all the variances because we just didn't have the sophisticated systems that we have today. Today, people are complaining if they order today and the Amazon box isn't here in the next day. And that same expectation of the speed of response you know, people have been living an unhealthy lifestyle for 20, 30, 40 years, and they automatically expect, well, hey, doctor, just give me a pill and I should be on my way. Yet right. that pill might mask some symptoms, but drive things deeper. What do you think, as someone that's dealing with this, is the major obstacles for people when, when number one, going to a functional medic, um, medical practitioner and then being able to implement what has been suggested because you're, you're going to have to take a variety of tests, for example, to figure out this puzzle. Like you said, it's 10% this, 60% this, 15% that, 5% that, 8% this, 2% mm -hmm. that. Um, and when you start working out that multiple variant algorithm, um, 
you know, we, algorithms are so popular. There's all these ones, these cascade effects inside the body. How do you determine, like, what's the obstacle? How do you determine it? And then as a time frame to implementation, what are you looking at for a lot of people? But what's the best case scenario versus what's the realistic scenario that most people struggle with? Yeah, so I got a call yesterday from a colleague who's a, an MD, he's a psychiatrist, and he had referred one of his patients uh, in another state to a local uh, functional medicine MD. And he read off, you know, the most salient points of the report that this doctor wanted the patient to do. And there were at least six to seven uh, lab tests, uh, nutritional IVs, six or seven supplements, um, all of these other therapies. And so I take a more of a layering approach. So there are some things that can't be fixed or helped in the body until other issues are addressed. And so if someone has mold and mycotoxins in their body, you're not going to be able to detoxify mercury or lead or aluminum. You're not going to be able to heal the gut and get it functioning optimally. So mold needs to be addressed first. And so I always start uh, with an organic acids test, which gives us a window into about five to six areas of someone's physiology. Everything from mold to gut health, to neurotransmitters, to B vitamin levels, to antioxidants. And so that can tell us where we need to go from there. But when you do that, uh, it allows the patient to digest the information better and be more compliant, not overwhelmed. Because when I first started practicing, I would try to just overwhelm the patient while I'm with my knowledge. And they would leave thinking, wow, that guy's really smart, but I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Right. And so it was really a disservice to them. And I had to, you know, swallow my pride and realize that. And so, um, you know, I think working on things such as environmental toxicity, um, mold, EMF, uh, you know, fixing your environment, you know, you can't heal in the same environment in which you got sick. 99.99% mm -hmm. of the time you can't. And so, you know, you can fix a lot of issues, uh, but you can't out supplement or out medicate a bad environment. And I include your social connections and social life in that as well. If you're around people who are constantly nagging you about eating healthy or nagging you about exercise, then you need to edit your life and get them out of there. You know, I know that sounds blunt and harsh, but it, it's going to be a psychological, which turns into a physiological strain on your system and no amount of supplementation or uh, good nutrition can outdo that. But uh, so based on the organic acids test, that can give me an idea of how much mold or if someone has mold. Um, and then the next test I typically do is a comprehensive um, stool analysis using PCR technology. And so that can tell us about, you know, any keystone species of bacteria that someone may be deficient in, uh, inflammation in the gut, how well their pancreas is producing digestive enzymes, their mucosal immunity, their secretory IgA, which lines not only the gut, the nasal cavity, the mouth, et cetera, um, and also about the levels of protozoa and parasites. And so uh, that can help us develop a more targeted approach. And I tell people, you know, a lot of times, if you have gut issues, it may not present as stomach pain, it may present as brain fog. Correct. or insomnia. And uh, you have to think of it this way. Every nutrient, with the exception of oxygen, has to go through the GI tract. And so if you have poor gut health, then it's going to lead to cellular malnutrition in the cells from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet. A couple points, because uh, I want to circle back where we haven't 
uh, close the loop on a couple of things. We got a couple open loops going, which is a lot of fun. I love these kind of conversations and I hope our listeners, you're enjoying this as much as I am. Let's talk about the mitochondria and its role in both energy production and it, when it's impaired, what's the cascade of effects? Because I think we hear a lot about mitochondria out there today. It's, it's starting to become a buzzword. Um, can you, in your best words, summarize what the mitochondria is, what's its roles, and how it's related to both uh, feeling good, but also the detoxification? And then maybe we can go into what are some of the things that impair its functions. And now for a Bioptimizer's fixed digestion tip, rapid cheat meal relief. Research shows that cheat meals can actually be an effective way to boost your metabolism. One key weight loss hormone, leptin, can be increased by up to 30% following a cheat meal. The challenge with the cheat meals is that all those extra calories and lower food quality can be hard to digest, which means you could be totally sidelined with a food coma after big cheat meals. The solution is to take strong digestive enzymes like masszymes, which will help rapidly digest and break down the extra food. Three to five capsules before or right after your cheat meal can make a huge difference in how you feel following the cheat meal. If it's a cheat day with multiple large meals, you might want to go up to 10 capsules or higher to help you power through all that food. To save 10% on masszymes, go to masszymes.com. That's M A S S. Z-Y-M-E-S dot com and enter the code CHEAT10 at checkout. Yeah, so one day I did this like nine, eight or nine years ago. I had a huge dry erase board on the wall and I wrote down pretty much every condition, disease and syndrome I could think of off the top of my head. And I sat down in the chair across from the whiteboard and I said, okay, what's the a connection between all of these things that are seemingly unconnected or disconnected. And the answer was mitochondrial dysfunction. So mitochondria, you know, we learn in high school biology, they're the batteries of the cells uh, and produce energy. And that's true, but I want to redefine how people think of the energy. So normally if I say energy, people think of bouncing off the walls, you know, running down the streets, but everything from me talking to you listening and processing um, to me sitting upright, not falling over requires energy. Hard and thinking, of- hard thinking. <laughs> if you look at the study chess players and how much weight lo- loss that they experience during grand master events, it's frightening. But you, you, yeah. like just that's an, that's, and that's an energy production chain. Yeah. And one thing that really throws people off, it threw me off many years ago when I learned it, is when you're repairing the mitochondria, you actually sleep better, which is counterintuitive because you think if you increase energy, then you're going to be wide awake, won't be able to sleep. But sleep is very energy intensive. And one of the main reasons for that is something you just mentioned, and that's detoxification. And most of that takes place during the first four to six hours of sleep. And so, um, you know, you have to take into account the mitochondria from a performance enhancement aspect. So, you know, by uh, making the mitochondria healthier, you can perform better athletically, academically, cognitively, et cetera. I want to stop that right there because you just, you just dropped a bomb um, on that sleep is very energy there's a big energy expenditure and would it be safe to say, so I have this theory um, that in my layman's terms type methodology for people, I call it, we know of what I call the Turkey dinner syndrome, where you have your Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner and you have all the fixings and you have all the stuff and you go back for a seconds and then grandma breaks out the pie. And then everybody kind of makes a dive for the, the living room furniture and somebody gets the couch and somebody's in the chair and someone's lying on the ground with the drool coming down their face. And you go, well, you've just loaded the system with all this protein, carbohydrates, fats, all these nutrients, all these, like nobody feels like going out and running a marathon. Right. So there is a management to, of digestion, which is a, which is a big energy cost, but 
so what happens is the body shuts down and goes to sleep. Would it be safe to say that the reason that we sleep is because of our need to detoxify from our current environment and lifestyle influences? Yes, I mean, that's certainly a major reason. Uh, you know, bodybuilders have known for years, you know, they've been very strict about going to bed at by 9 p.m. because they want to get that growth hormone spike. And, you know, sleep architecture, there is a certain um, a, such a thing as a chronotype, but it's not really healthy or it isn't healthy for anyone to be up at one in the morning typing emails or writing a newsletter. And so, um, you know, there's the hormonal benefits that we get. Um, there's the detoxification component of sleep. And then we have the glymphatic system. So the lymphatic system that's in the brain, that's when most of the neurons in the central nervous system sort of dump their garbage. And uh, that's what allows it to drain from the neck. And that's the whole premise behind incline bed therapy. So when you incline the head of the bed six to 12 inches, it helps the glymphatic system drain during sleep. That's a fascinating uh, component. Is there any other things that you feel overall? Because oftentimes when you, you see people who are suffering from a variety of these um, metabolic conditions or, or, you know, their toxicity issues, they're, they're, they're tired all the time, or they don't have energy, or they have this brain fog, they're sleeping 10 hours, 12 hours a day, they don't have any energy. Mm -hmm. um, can you tie that in to detoxification and then mitochondria and like what's, so we talked about the detoxification, but then the mitochondria. So how do those two pieces interface? Yeah. So some of, I would say the two uh, most dangerous toxins to the mitochondria, one would be mold slash mycotoxins. They go straight to the mitochondria and they put a block on a pathway called NRF2, which is a series of reactions that produces antioxidants and detoxification molecules. And I would say after mold and mycotoxins, you have lead and other metals, specifically lead, which will literally line the inner mitochondrial membrane and dramatically, dramatically decrease mitochondrial energy production. So it's kind of a catch-22 because you have these toxins that slow mitochondrial function, but when mitochondrial function is slowed, it's almost impossible to detoxify. Correct. It's a cascade effects. And of course, there's some evidence, of course, um, that the fall of Rome was correct. It was correlated with the use of lead pipes and the, and the dysfunction that started to happen in the population. And then that was reemerged in, uh, in, the, in, in Britain uh, a number of years ago, many decades ago, where they started to discontinue the use of lead pipes and lead paints which no one thinks about that now, but right. then we go, oh, wait a second. And then now one of the complex issues that we have going on in the world is that we are manufacturing chemicals at an exponential rate in the world in combination with the use of blue light uh, on so many things, which is disrupting our natural circadian rhythm. So now we have, we're impairing, we're adding thousands and thousands of variants of toxins, which we don't know what they do in conjunction in as well as disrupting our natural detoxification cycle. And right. then we've got, you know, maybe we have mitochondria. So how do we turn the ship around under these, these, as you said, this kind of environment of the modern world and its impact on us as, as humans? Yeah, so one other connection I'll mention is the mind mitochondrial link. So they've done studies and shown that within three to five minutes of experiencing a psychological or mental or emotional stressor, your mitochondrial energy production goes way down. And that, you know, so you can have there are, um, no toxins in your body. I mean, we won't find anyone with that situation today, but it's theoretically possible 
but they're experiencing emotional and mental and psychological stressors, and that's decreasing their uh, mitochondrial energy production. And so, um, you know, the mitochondria, another important uh, aspect to them is that 9% of your body's mitochondria are in the brain, but they consume around 22% of your body's oxygen. So that is to say that you have a handful of mitochondria doing a lot of work. And so one of the very first places you notice mitochondrial dysfunction is memory, concentration, mood, and sleep issues. Right. And this is something that is quite common as we age. We'll mm -hmm. see aging adults um, dealing with cognitive decline. We start seeing them also have you know, disrupted sleep patterns. Oftentimes they can't sleep at night. They wake up and these type of things. And now we're starting to see this emerge in younger and younger generations as we go forward. So now that we've kind of identified a lot of the different uh, problems and, and, and we couldn't possibly touch on them all, what is, your what, what is your strategy for turning it around? What it, well, like, I'm going back, because I love that visual where you wrote down all the different things. So here's all the potential things in the algorithm. So all the variables that you could possibly think of. And then now you're doing an order of magnitude, I suspect. So it's, you know, and, and then which things first as a, and then we're, I know we're kind of generalizing here, but what are the things, the big needle movers to kind of turn the ship around when people are number one, want to prevent it, but number two, if they get in some of those situations. So I'll mention the low hanging fruit first, um, because Several of them are free or close to free, but getting morning sunlight uh, is extremely important because in the mitochondria, we have this proton gradient that drives ATP production. Um, but photons, I read in, in two different publications that around two thirds of a mitochondria energy production is due to photons. And so when we get the harmful blue light, you know, from inside and we don't get the beneficial blue light from the sun. So it's not just the vitamin D we get from the sun. It's many, many other things. And you got to remember that the retina and the eye, it's very mitochondrially dense. So the eye is just an extension of the brain. It's still neurological tissue. And so, um, you know, having said that, uh, with the, the brain and, um, you know, the mitochondrial dysfunction showing up there pretty much first, going outside, getting morning sunlight on as much surface area of your body as possible. And then again in the evening, because there's some red light in there as well, which is also healthy and beneficial for your mitochondria. And you're getting the photons. And while you're out there, why not take your shoes and socks off and get some grounding in, which is going to add electrons. And anytime you add electrons to your body, you're decreasing inflammation. So, you know, your lifestyle and your environment. Number two is getting your circadian rhythm optimized. And, you know, this takes some time because if you're going to bed right now at 11 p.m., I have people work backwards 15 minutes every two to three days. And, you know, it'll take a while to, to get there. But studies have shown that the levels of NAD+, plus, which is a mitochondrial energy metabolite, the levels are 200 to 300 times higher when your circadian rhythm is optimized versus when you're staying up and you should be sleeping. So those two things, you know, are both free um, and it's just a matter of, um, you know, incorporating them into your routine. And uh, I would say the next thing in terms of fixing the mitochondria would be something that you talked about, and that's artificial blue lights. And so uh, daytime blue blockers you can get for, you know, reading the screen or your phone. Um, because, you know, blue lights, artificial blue lights is going to negatively impact the mitochondria. 
and the brain on many levels. And so if we can block that blue light, and then I have a colleague, he's actually in California and he has two offices and he replaced all the artificial blue lights with amber and red lights. And so he said it kind of freaked the patients at first because they thought they might have been going into the red light district, I guess. <laughs> yes. But, but, you know, uh, now everyone's adjusted to it. And uh, I mean, it can only help. And it, it's not something that's extremely expensive at all to do. Uh, red light therapy has been used uh, up until the late 70s, early 80s in traditional hospitals for wound healing. And it does that, uh, it expedites healing by energizing the mitochondria, increasing nitric oxide production. So you get increased nutrient delivery. And so um, my device that I loaned to my dad at the moment, it has red and near infrared bulbs. And so if you have brain fog, you can hold it about four to six inches from the back of your head for five minutes. And usually that'll energize the brain and it'll clear up the brain fog because usually it's due to too much oxidative stress. And so the red light therapy uh, is a big needle mover. Another um, big needle mover is getting the bad stuff out. So when we talk about functional medicine, it really comes down to two things, getting the bad stuff out and putting the good stuff back in. So the bad stuff, mold and mycotoxins. So I don't know if you can see it, but behind me, I have an air doctor and it filters down to, I think it's like 0 0.009 microns. And so we talked about the damage that uh, mycotoxins and mold due to the mitochondria. And so, um, so other bacteria, viruses, Dander. When you say they, when you say an air doctor, is that's an air doctor filtration system, air filtration? Yeah, system? so it's an ultra HEPA plus carbon filtration system, mm -hmm. and uh, it also has an air ionizer on it, and uh, it was really sort of a game changer in that market space because the other models that were endorsed by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, they were over a thousand dollars, some up to two thousand dollars or more. Um, but this one, you know, without a discount code is around 625, I think. Oh, that's really Yeah. And you don't have to change the filters very often. Um, but you know, the gentleman who brought it to market, you know, wanted to more people to have access to better quality air. And so that's another game changer. And then something that I have sitting in my living room is a molecular hydrogen machine. Mm -hmm. And that machine, it uh, produces the water. So I put distilled water in it and I turn it on at a certain percentage and it generates the um, molecular hydrogen water, but it also comes with a nasal cannula. So you can breathe it. And a lot of times when I'm working on the computer or if I'm on a phone consultation, I'll be plugged into it because it's very quiet. And you get slightly different benefits from, you know, breathing it versus drinking it. You know, they both have their benefits. But what makes molecular hydrogen so unique is that it's incredibly small. And that allows for it to get inside of our mitochondria. And so it helps to heal the mitochondria that we have, but it also stimulates the production of new mitochondria. And prior to this, the only other thing we knew that did that was aerobic exercise. Yes. Um, fantastic uh, components in here. Um, I want to switch gears just a little bit because I think this is becoming a huge topic and I know it's going to be a little bit taboo, so you don't have to go on there, but there's a lot of people who are um, debating on whether they should go and get the jab right now and its potential influence we don't have to get into super specifics on it because I know everything gets kind of picked off nowadays of what you say and what you can't say. Um, basically, we don't have any long-term studies on any of these impacts and we're using a novel delivery system in most of the jabs. <laughs> That's all I'm going to use that word. As a functional 
medical practitioner. Do you have concerns about the current uh, trajectory and, and, and suggestions that are put forth in the politicization of this kind of piece? Do you think there could be some negative consequences? Absolutely. And, you know, what caught me as interesting is that, you know, there's, I think, almost 300 medical professionals who've spoken out against the shot or at least had concerns about it and they get dismissed. But yet we take Bill Gates as advice and recommendations and he can't keep a virus off my computer. How's he going to keep a virus? My, I said the exact same thing. You know, so I have serious concerns because they were working on that vaccine for 10 to 11 years before this pandemic slash pandemic. And so, uh, you know, how were they able to develop it in six to eight months? And if you look uh, at where the uh, spike proteins go in the body, one of the most concentrated areas are the ovaries. Yes. Um, this is something that was brought up by um, Brett Weinstein and his wife, and I remiss on her name. It's one of the, and I, I, I love the science that they do. They, they, they are real scientists. They're not politicization. They're not into hyperbole. They get experts and they, they don't come to conclusions quickly. Um, what do you think is some of the potential risks that we're using with all of these millions of people who are just going in there and getting this. And, and if I look at the data, I mean, I'm looking at the research and it says, well, it doesn't prevent you from getting the virus. It doesn't prevent you from transmitting the virus, but it reduces your uh, chances of severe symptoms by this much. And therefore it's 95% effective. And I'm like, 95% effective about what? Especially when we're considering we have, an, we have a, a, a vote for the general population until I think you're over 60 years old, we've got over a 99% six, success rate with this uh, about you know, not losing your life or having massive complications. Yet right. we do know that the third leading cause of death in the country is medical error. And yet we're, we're, we're trading a 1% risk with the third leading cause of death. And I'm going, I don't know if I like, it's like, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm done on the uh, blackjack table because that's 51% odds. I'm gonna go over to the, to the slot machine that's right. you know, at terrible odds, you know, and, and I'm gonna go that route because that's a better route because someone told me that. That just doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense to you? No, it never made sense. And you know, I had people, I've heard at least, from 10 separate individuals, none of whom know one another, that they have a family member or a loved one who passed away due to unrelated causes. So the example I give quite often is uh, one girl I know, her friend's dad passed away from cancer. He had cancer long before this current state of affairs. But on the death certificate, they put COVID. And they actually had to hire an attorney and go to court to get it changed. And so I started doing some digging. And so this doesn't come from some quack in his garage. This is from colleagues in the hospital, a nurse who had 25 years experience who used to review claims for the insurance company. Apparently every death they marked as related to COVID, they get around $35,000. And for every ventilator they put in, they get a minimum of $9,000. And so if you think about it, did the regular flu, what happened to it? Did it just go away? Of course not. And if you look at, uh, you know, they're incentivizing people to get the jab. So, you know, oh, we'll give you a bag of Twinkies. We'll give you... We just gave away millions of dollars in California here. They, we just opened up and they're like giving it, they're having a lot of. Right. And, and what makes no sense to me is that studies are very clear that when your blood sugar is above 126 um, nanogram, nanograms per deciliter um, in terms of your blood glucose, that your white blood cells are immobilized. And so the same people yelling at me for not wearing a mask 
are generally, you know, going through the McDonald's drive through and uh, getting dessert. And they don't ask them if they have uh, 3000 studies on, you know, the ingredients in their hamburgers, but, you know, they want to hassle me because I don't have them a mask. And, you know, when I get asked if I'm getting the jab, I say, do you have herpes? And what? Well, it's a rather personal question, right? So exactly. I wouldn't ask you that. So don't ask me a personal question. And what makes no sense is if the vaccine does in fact work, saying that you have to have one in order for mine to work is the equivalent of saying that I'm going to put my winter coat on, Wade, but in order for it to work, you have to put yours on and it has to work. Yeah, the, the logic flow is is falls apart, but we do see um, the mass hypnotization of even very intelligent people in regards to this situation and people that the, the general public are relying on for definitive information to give them health advice. And I always say, you know what, at the end of the day, um, you there's nobody more important in the charge and care of your health than yourself. And I preach responsibility. I also preach um, get uh, differing opinions. We don't just accept one opinion, go in there and challenge these opinions because these could have very impactful uh, consequences down the road. Particularly, I'm concerned with the younger you are, um, the more potential problems that you could unexpected because we just don't know what we, we haven't done the trials we've done no trials on pregnancy we do know that some of the animal studies were very uh controversial in what they were performing let switch uh, one gear so we've kind of laid down the bad news F for you as a functional medical practitioner what are the things that you suggest to build up our natural immunity because at the end of the day Nothing can trump, sorry to use that word, folks, natural immunity um, right. because, you know, our, our immune systems have evolved over millions of years and, are, and, and probably if you get COVID and develop natural antibodies, there's nothing in the world that is more superior in fighting off even variants that might emerge because you get a 3% variance, I think is the statistic. And so you still are probably going to pick those off as well. What are the things that you're suggesting for your clients to do in order to bolster their immune system? Well, some things I recommended, a lot of these I recommended prior to the pandemic, uh, things like replenishing zinc levels. So after magnesium, zinc is the second most common mineral deficiency. And it's extremely important for immune function and white blood cell formation. And so optimizing zinc is important. Selenium is important because it aids in the production of glutathione. And glutathione is a natural antiviral. Uh, three, going to bed on time slash optimizing your circadian rhythm. Four, getting natural sunlight. So natural vitamin D that's already sulfated, your body can use. Um, but if you're in an area where you're not getting a lot of sunlight, certainly supplement with a D3 K2 supplement, um, colostrum. And if you don't like colostrum on alternative that is made from colostrum is PRP or proline rich polypeptides. And I have a whole book on my bookshelf, um, PRPs, but that was done. The studies were done at the university of Texas in patients with HIV. And they saw their uh, viral load go down dramatically. And it's kind of like PRPs are pretty much like an adaptogen for the immune system. So it helps to modulate it. And so it doesn't, you know, spike one uh, area of function and suppress another. It just sort of makes it even keel and supports whatever it needs to do or the body's inherent wisdom. Uh, so those are some of the most important thing, but molecular hydrogen, uh, because it helps to control the cytokine storm. And so it's not technically the virus, it's the cytokine storm. And now that's sort of a buzzword. But when I started using it, you know, 10 years ago, people were like, what? Um, but cytokines, you know, there are pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. But the molecular hydrogen helps to decrease that cytokine storm. And in addition, 
uh, by supporting mitochondrial health. So you can have an optimal amount of immune cells, but if they don't or can't produce enough energy to get to where they need to go, then they are doing us a disservice. So that's another area that the molecular hydrogen comes in. And, you know, the vitamin D supplements and keeping your blood sugar up. Those are the main things. Uh, you know, Dr. Tim, this is just so much fun. We could have a lot of talks. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of rabbit holes. And I'll have to get you back on the podcast because I think this is a good opener. Can you, before we close off and kind of get all the references, well, where do you see functional medicine or this practice say 10 years, 20 years, 30 years into the future, because 10 years ago, nobody knew what it is. Almost everyone in the biohacking field, the people who are looking at both health, being healthy and extending that over a long period of time, increasing the biospan, as I like to call it, where do you see this going and how pervasive do you anticipate it will be in, in, in public health? Yeah, so uh, I think it depends on how you define it. You know, now it's cool to do functional medicine. So I lived in Arizona for about nine or 10 months back in 2016. I thought, oh, this is going to be great. You know, people know exactly what I'm talking about. They're going to speak my language. And so, you know, I would see driving down the street, functional medicine. And so I would stop, go in, ask to speak with the owner or the doctor, and, you know, he would say, yeah, um, we recommend vitamin D and sometimes probiotics and that's it. I'm like, okay, well, that's not really functional medicine. Um, so, you know, it depends on what people mean by it. The other component we have to consider, and I'm seeing this a lot right now, my friend in California who used to do stem cells, now uh, it's only a matter of time before every company receives a cease and desist letter, which is why many clinics are opening up in Mexico um, because stem cells, you know, when you heal things on that level um, and at the level of the mitochondria, you know, you're taking away a lot of profit from a lot of people. And so even though uh, they haven't harmed anyone, to my knowledge, uh, they've only helped and you know, what we call side effects in traditional medicine, we call fringe benefits in functional medicine. And so, uh, you know, I've seen case studies, uh, for example, one lady, her cardiovascular output uh, increased by 46% after six months of stem cell infusions. And so uh, I think it'll become much more prevalent. You know, people are becoming increasingly empowered and we can't really talk about this without talking about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. And I think that's what has the government scared is the decentralization and the empowerment to the people. Um, you know, I think a lot of it uh, relates back to that. And, you know, it's not really conspiracy theory. It's really just fact at this point, um, because the things I said that I've stood by from the beginning of the pandemic are now proven to be true. And so I hope it becomes more and more um, mainstream to where, you know, it's not considered alternative. Uh, it's considered the only medicine. I love it. And, you know, futurists are always subjected to ridicule, conjecture, condemnation, then begrudging acceptance, and then it becomes mainstream, as they say. And I believe that humans being an adaptive species by nature, uh, through their ability to communicate and to be able to extrapolate uh, information and share that information, and then to abstract solutions and run experiments, is what will allow us to survive uh, rapid civilization and technological input in the society. And so where can people reach you, find out from you, hire you, whatever they need? Like, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so my website is healyourbody.org. So that's H-T-T-P-S colon backslash backslash healyourbody.org. And there's a work with Dr. Tim or apply to work with Dr. Tim tab on there. And you can send me a message and I'll get that. 
and get back to you. And I wanted to um, mention if they put the code BioOptimizers10, that I'll extend a 10% discount on an initial consultation, one hour consultation. Dr. Tim, that's so generous of you. I really appreciate it. Now, I'm sure some of our listeners are going to jump in and, and take advantage. I would certainly encourage them to do so because functional medicine is the, this is where technology and your health is kind of fusing together today in the world to make kind of this area of biohacking and longevity. And of course, the avoidance of what are many times avoidable diseases or dysfunctions in the body. So we want to live long, we want to live strong. Any final words uh, for our audience of encouragement before we close out? I would say listen to your podcast because I reviewed your list of guests and I was super impressed. You know, certainly I think I have great content to bring to the table, but uh, you know, like you mentioned in the beginning, we're swimming in a sea of information, but starving for knowledge. And I think your podcast brings knowledge and wisdom. Oh, that's very kind of you. And I thank you so much. There you have it, folks, from electrons, mitochondria, to blockchain. There are things that you can do to change your life, your health, and your vitality. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Like it, share it, and make sure that you reach out to Dr. Tim. Take advantage of his kind and generous offer. And most of all, remember that environment is stronger than will. So if you're not as well as you'd like to be, you need to change your environment and surely your future will change. So long for this week. I'm Wayne T. Lightheart from Bioptimizers. Thank you so much for joining this episode and we'll see you on the next one. Take care. At Bioptimizers, our mission is to fix digestion and a cornerstone of digestion is gut flora. P3OM is our patented probiotic formula. In fact, we call it the Navy SEALs of probiotics. You see, strong proteolytic or protein digesting activity is paramount to having a healthy gut flora. And of course, P3OM provides that. The good news is, unlike weaker probiotics, P3OM survives the digestion process. What it does is it basically multiplies the good guys while protecting you against pathogens or what some people call the bad guys. P3OM really helps to rebuild your digestion. And what that allows you to do is to maximize nutrient uptake, energy, and metabolism. To find out more of how P3OM can help you, go to www.bioptimizers.com. Thank you for listening to the Bioptimizers Awesome Health Podcast. You can find more information at bioptimizers.com.